Let's begin. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us to our virtual Grand Rounds today. Uh, our first and last speaker will be Dr. Ovin Carrasquillo, whom is Professor of Medicine and Public Health and Chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine. The second speaker will be Dr. Howard Anapol, who is Assistant Professor of Medicine, Medical Director of the Internal Medicine Clinic at Lenar, and also serves as Medical Director of Student Health Service of the University of Miami. <clears throat> The third speaker will be Dr. Alex Machaber, whom is Professor of Medicine, the Bernard Fojo Chair in Medicine Education and Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate Medical Education. And the fourth speaker is Dr. Aaron Kobitz, whom is Professor of Medicine and Public Health Sciences, Associate Director, Population Science and Cancer Disparity at Sylvester and Chief of Population Health for the Oncology Service Line at UHealth. She is also the Vice Provost for Research at UM. She will be joined by Dr. Natasha Sol, who is an assistant professor of medicine and co-director of Sylvester's Behavioral and Community Research Shared Resource. Welcome all to our grand rounds. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, thank you uh, for everybody for, for joining us. Um, um, I, I thought we'd and we can start with the first slide. Um, I thought we'd start with, um, you know, providing everybody a little bit uh, of an update on some of the stuff that we're doing around the COVID response. We've, many of us have been very focused on direct patient care activities, uh, but it's important to highlight about some of the uh, work we've been doing up in the division, uh, been meeting some of the other non-direct patient care response needs, but also talk about some, some of the cutting edge research that, uh, as I like to say GIM, but also some friends of GIM faculty are doing a very public health relevant research. Um, next slide. Um, first, I'll go through a little bit of the latest data. It's really important uh, to discuss with the department, uh, the trends that we're seeing and where we are in the epidemic. And then Howard Anapol will talk about his leadership role in the student health service. Alex will talk about what he's been doing with undergraduate medical education, and then Aaron Kovitz and I will talk about some of the really interesting research and, um, that's been going on uh, related to uh, COVID. Next slide. So here we are uh, today um, in terms of the numbers, and these keep changing every second. Um, when you look at these numbers, sort of static and everything, obviously each of these is a very, very um, sad uh, case of uh, of what's been going on both uh, worldwide and here nationally. Uh, here, as you heard, we surpassed 1 million uh, cases and we also surpassed 60,000. I think by the end of today, the data will be in. And the epidemic has really hit us disproportionately. If you look at the case rates of both deaths uh, and cases, much higher, probably not as hard as some countries like Spain or Italy uh, based on rates, uh, but some states like New York just have been really, really hammered and Florida has been really, really different. And when you understand these numbers, understand as you're seeing that uh, for many places, even the United States with good public health systems, um, they underestimate the total death count. A lot of deaths uh, that happen, especially at home that haven't been COVID tested or not being documented as COVID deaths, is probably up in some states I hear uh, rates 50% higher than what have been reported. Um, so it's really important to understand this is really disproportionately affected. Um, you know, our country uh, and obviously some parts of the US. Next slide. Uh, this is a Florida, as of yesterday from Florida. And as you will see in terms of who gets the disease up, uh, you know, it affects all age groups uh, as you see the distribution here. But when you look at hospitalization and deaths, we really do see concentrations among the elderly and particularly uh, those with uh, severe underlying diseases. Um, among those tested, it's about a hospitalization rate of 16% and a case fatality rate that's fluctuating around 3 to 4%, which is similar to what's been reported in several other countries. Uh, others in Italy uh, was somewhat higher uh, because of their age distribution. Next slide. Um, and now what we've all been talking about is flattening the curve. Um, as you will see uh, here in the United States, uh, what we're seeing is that actually the numbers have been flattening. However, they're still staying uh, pretty high up there. It's not like a dramatic decrease. In Florida, as I'll show in a second, you see the numbers may be a little bit better and decreasing, but we have all these swaths where the numbers uh, are going up. I was just talking to somebody in California and you know they're concerned uh, that the numbers are actually trending up, not down as you would expect. Here in Florida, we are seeing and starting to see a downward trend uh, 
thank God. Uh, and that's very positive. Uh, next slide. This is another way. Uh, this comes from, um, you know, um, you know, data from um, our surveillance systems that we have in state. It's called the early notification of our community-based epidemics or essence, which is what state would have. We look at our ED visits uh, for coffee associated admissions, we do sort of see a downward trend. And if we look um, at ED visits that mention cough or shortness of breath, we do see a downward trend, which does suggest that we are sort of flattening the curve. Um, Jackson, uh, as of yesterday, they had 163 inpatients. I think that went down this morning. Um, and actually the Jackson Health System, about 25% of all the COVID admissions have been at Jackson. Uh, but U Health, we currently have about 40 inpatients. Uh, again, the numbers change by the hour. Um, but at least the data looks somewhat optimistic of where we are uh, for the state, uh, although you know we're still very concerned. Next slide. And things are very much back to normal. This is my commute this morning on US-1. Uh, and obviously this scares us from the second wave coming. Uh, but it does look like the state is slowly opening. Um, so it's a good time to reflect, I think, back a little bit on what's happened, um, you know, here locally and some of the initiatives that we've been doing over the last two months uh, to meet this epidemic. Um, and I think I'll hand it over uh, with those numbers uh, to Howard Annapol, who will talk a little bit about the work that's been done in student health. Hello, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to join in uh, this presentation, and I appreciate all the help uh, from our college at the medical campus, not only with this situation, but with the care of the students. Next slide, please. Let's just give a, a general idea of uh, the events since we first became aware of the situation in January. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, soon after we uh, realized that uh, the events were unfolding in the Hubei province, we identified a student who had recently returned, may have been one of the very first uh, tested in Dade County and tested negative. At that time, we were able to uh, put an alert on our, in our EMR for all students that arrived from that area and uh, started to pre-screen. Some of the other um, more important uh, events uh, as the situation unfolded were uh, up updating the information on our website, starting to track, starting to screen. In addition to the screening uh, information or questions that were provided from the health system, we added some that were specific to the situation in our environment. Unfortunately, with the use of our EMR, we're able to update things fairly quickly. As everyone else did, we continued to, to screen uh, travelers. Uh, by mid-March, we had the first known case in a student on the medical campus, uh, followed uh, a, a week or so later by a case on the Gables campus. And then as uh, everyone did within the U-Health system, we quickly changed the way we do business by creating outdoor triage, outdoor care, and going from a, a system where we were drop in to where we had to be appointment only with uh, telemedicine. Next slide, please. Sometime before the students went away for spring break, uh, they uh, asked me what I needed and I said, I, can I have some tents? And they said, what are you gonna do with your tents? And I said, gosh, I'm really not sure, but can I have some tents? And here's what we ended up doing with the tents. We didn't know if the students were gonna arrive back or how many would come, but uh, as it turned out, uh, some did arrive back and we used uh, one of the tents for testing. We did just a little bit of testing before we returned our supplies to the medical campus, did triage and uh, treatment, had the, the docs almost always, uh, or the nurse practitioners run out to the tent and take care of students and once in a while would bring someone in if they absolutely needed to be brought in. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense that the university uh, is a global uh, university with a broad uh, footprint, and uh, not only students coming from all over the, the world, but studying all over the world. One of the next big challenges was how do you uh, bring back students from study abroad? Uh, the, the first group of students arrived back from Italy, uh, and then we uh, 
continue to bring them back, uh, transitioning to places like the, the UK, which wasn't on the initial list, and ending up with our students that were in, in the Galapagos. One of the interesting comments I heard was, oh, Galapagos, a perfect place to be during a pandemic, but those of you who know about the travel industry in the Galapagos know that that didn't end up to be the case. Uh, people from the Galapagos uh, travel everywhere during that time of year, and uh, people certainly spend a lot of uh, time visiting the Galapagos from all over the, the world. Next slide, please. Just a general idea of who we are and, and what we do. We provide primary care to the university students, including the medical students. We also fulfill a public health role, in, including managing the mandatory immunization program. You'll see in my list of situations that we've dealt with that somehow anthrax got on there twice. I'm not sure exactly how that happened. I only remember one event of white powder scouted all over the reception desk and the uh, uh, and the paramedics coming in their hazmat suits. But we've dealt with all of these in one way or another, including most recently last year. Some of you may have read about the situation of adenovirus that affected some of the other universities, specifically uh, Maryland, and led to a lot of media attention. And we also, unfortunately, had a few cases of adenovirus last year. We care for 15,000 students. 4,000, 4,300 live on campus. We have almost 30,000 annual visits. And prior to COVID, completely open access. If you wanna come see us, you come that day. We offer same day appointments and about 60% of choose to just walk in. But we have a you know, relatively modest staff who uh, work hard to accomplish all that needs to be accomplished. Next slide, please. Domestic students, where do they come from? Uh, no surprise, I don't think to anyone, that we are well represented in the areas that had initial outbreaks of COVID, which made the decision on whether to have the students arrive back after spring break even more difficult, and some re representation on the uh, West Coast, uh, Texas, Illinois. Next slide, please. Here's our international students from, who come from everywhere, including you can see the largest dot there representing a, a, a very large contingency from China, or which uh, brought this to our attention early in the epidemic pandemic. Next slide, please. Some of the key decision-making uh, events for the university at large, uh, some of you were involved and aware of this with the initial travel uh, precautions leading to the major events for the Gables campus on uh, how to respond to the students return from spring break. The initial decision was to extend spring break. That gave everyone a little bit of uh, leeway to, for decision making. And then it became perfectly clear that it would be imprudent to have students returning from all over the country and all over to the world uh, as the pandemic was unfolding. Uh, the challenges that were faced after that were what to do with the, the students who still had things on campus and how do you start uh, launching tele, I'm sorry, how do you start launching uh, classes uh, virtually uh, in the way, same way that we've had to launch medicine virtually. Next slide, please. This just gives a sense of our overnight uh, change in our operations. Uh, we have the ability to do most of our check-in via uh, uh, kiosks. We can ask uh, HPI questions on there. We can adjust that daily. And uh, uh, students are able to arrive into our clinic with very little interaction with uh, receptionists. Overnight, we had to figure out how we were going to do this and protect our staff. Uh, you'll see at the interim step on the other end where we did have some reception staff out there, but we eventually transitioned to those uh, QR codes where the students would just arrive to the check-in table, use a QR code to able to get to check-in via mobile device. So check-in via kiosk became check-in via mobile device pretty much overnight. Next slide, please. Among the other functions that uh, health centers fulfill is health education. We have a health educator who works with the students, has a group of peer educators, and they very quickly got involved in health education, uh, via, mostly via social media, as you would expect uh, during this time. Next slide, please. This is my, it could have been a slide. A lot of uh, what happened on our campus was actually fortunate timing. If this had occurred at an earlier time in the semester, 
when students were arriving from everywhere and we didn't have spring break as a buffer, it, it could have been a much more difficult situation. But we did have hundreds of students who were on this trip to Bimini. They left out of Port Everglades uh, early, early March to, to mid-March. And uh, those unfortunate folks in Texas just happened to have a spring break that was a little bit later and led to a much more difficult situation uh, for our colleagues in, in Texas. Next slide, please. One of the many challenges of a residential environment is that our dorms are pretty much like cruise ships. And uh, we've all seen uh, different r knots uh, published for different situations. I've seen r knots in the cruise industry starting out in the teens and then lowering down to the three, four range. I don't know what an r knot would be in a very controlled environment on a, on a college campus in a residential college, but it would be not insignificant. Uh, they I, I, eat together, me, they would, live together. Um, one minute left, just FYI. Uh, sure. Uh, they congregate together, uh, and uh, one of the big challenges was uh, how do you get them home and how do you depopulate? Uh, we went from 43,000 to 200. Next slide, please. We developed a self-report tool. We have the ability to do a via Qualtrics through single sign-on to some of our questions that made the situation. Oh, oh, Next slide, please. I ordered my father. I told him my application. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, contract, contact tracing, as was done uh, by others. Uh, fortunately, out of those that we self isolated and contract, there were no secondary cases that we were aware of. Next slide, please. You need to finish up now, Howard. Next slide, please. please. Last slide. The last slide, which has, I guess, there it is. Yeah, uh, last slide just uh, shows the, the reopening challenges, no different than the reopening challenges in uh, most places and uh, lots and lots of work to be done to decide how this is gonna be implemented. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Howard. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about our COVID related issues or initiatives related to medical student education and our medical student programs. Next slide, thank you. The first challenge, of course, was the delivery of our curriculum and we had to think very quickly about how to do this. Thankfully, we had been at the forefront of video capture for our curriculum in years one and two, really since 1999. So we quickly, we already had our, our lectures in the first and second year online and so we continued that but we quickly had to convert to Zoom platform for our small group sessions and our learning that way. And the faculty really did a terrific job of delivering the curriculum in that way and adapting pretty quickly. By the 13th, literally one day after we decided to go online, the 13th of March, we already had our endocrine module small groups done via Zoom with really little difficulty and, and, did, and went quite well. We also began converting our clinical skills standardized patient sessions to online formats as well, converting them to telehealth sessions, being able to teach and assess our medical students in communication skills via that platform. And also had to move our assessments to completely remote, remotely being done using a system that the university has through Blackboard to be able to provide some exam security while still testing students remotely from their uh, homes. The third and fourth year curriculum posed some interesting challenges in that obviously direct patient contact is an important part of that curriculum in the third and fourth year. We made a decision early on on the 15th of March to pull students out of direct patient contact in part because of availability of PPE, concerns about our students being asymptomatic carriers of COVID for our patients. And so we made the decision prior actually to the Association of American Medical Colleges making the recommendation to remove students from direct patient contact to do that. We converted all of our third year curriculum to online didactics and that continues. We wanted to keep students engaged in the clerkships, at least from that perspective, and made a decision with the clerkship directors to move the clinical experiences to a later time when they can come back safely into the patient care environment and in more of an abbreviated fashion. We made some changes to the fourth year curriculum in order to make sure that our students could graduate on time by removing some of the elective requirements 
again, delivering content online and being able to ensure that our students were meeting the competencies that we require still in an online format. All of this, of course, required LCME approval. And then we met with the LCME and they gave us the approval and, and to go forward with these sorts of plans. Next slide, please. Courtesy of Gary Agarwal, I just want to give you a timeline of some of the changes that were made, particularly in the clerkship years. As I mentioned, on the 15th of March, we made a decision to remove all the students from the clinical environment. And the clerkship directors and coordinators then spent some time really learning the platform well so that we could deliver the content via uh, online platform. The decision, as I, made, as I said, was made to remove the clinical experience and delay it to later. We modified the clerkship schedules and we've spent a lot of time modifying the clerkship schedules so that we can bring students back in the environment safely at a time when we can do that without delaying graduation. We also had to deliver our shelf exams done by the NVME remotely and that went without any difficulty as well. Next slide, please. This is just a snapshot from the AAMC to give you a sense of what other schools were doing around the country. This was snapshot was taken on the 10th of April and you can see that um, over 90% of schools at that point had already removed face-to-face -face clinical experiences for first and second year students in addition to the third and fourth year students. We were ahead of the curve in that perspective by doing this um, back in, on the 15th of March. Next slide, please. Of course, with new challenges come opportunities, and there are lots of different pending questions and future plans that we think about on a daily basis. The first, of course, is when to bring students back into the clinical environment. Some of that will be dependent, of course, on national guidelines, availability of PPE and training for PPE, the testing of students and faculty, and how often to do that, what our clinical affiliates are willing to do with respect to all students back into the environment. We're going to be able to continue to use some of the innovations. And as I mentioned, these challenges came opportunities, opportunities to think about innovative, innovative ways to deliver the curriculum, such as the Zoom platform. We're now embarking on telehealth training for our students so they can have that experience as well with our physicians. We're thinking about how career advice might be impacted by a more abbreviated clerkship format when students come back into the environment. Many of you have heard that our licensure programs and licensure exams, USMLE exams, have been put on hold because of the closure of chrometric centers, and we have to factor in then how students are going to be able to take those exams within their clerkships coming forward. And then, of course, in graduation requirements, we want to ensure that our students can still graduate on time despite the, the limited time or more abbreviated time when they come back to the clinical environment. So lots of pending questions and future plans that we will have to continue to monitor and uh, adapt as we go. Next slide, please. Of course, we couldn't have our, our match day ceremony and physical uh, presence on campus. So our students unfortunately had to celebrate on their own independently. Despite that, our students continue to do exceedingly well. These are just some of the statistics and trends that we saw in this year's senior class with respect to matching an uptick in students matching in our programs here from 21% to 26%, about a third staying in Florida, and then you can see increases in the other specialties there. Next slide. Unfortunately, we also have to have a virtual commencement. It will occur on May 9th. It'll be done via Zoom. We've hired a production company to ensure that this can still be done in a professional manner. There'll be recorded speeches and some live uh, speeches as well. Um, musical performances. We want to be able to highlight the students so that they really feel like they're graduating um, and live recitation of the physician's oath. There, there is some talk about having a physical commencement in December, perhaps with the law school where some students have indicated they'd be willing to come back to actually have a physical commencement and be hooded. More details on that later. Next slide. And let me just end with a, a plug for the tremendous volunteer work that our students have been part of. They never cease to amaze me and they embody the culture of our institution. Next slide. Our students themselves created this 501c3 group called Miami Med COVID Help. And through that group have done a number of different things, such as providing health to, help to our healthcare providers by running errands for them, delivery of meals to the emergency department staff. They have collected over $500,000 of PPE that now has been donated, printed 3D face mask shields, and have been involved in a number of different initiatives at our institution. Over 175 students have participated in our COVID hotline being run at the Poison Control Center. 
And they've also been involved in a number of our public health initiatives that I think you're going to hear about from Aaron COVID, such as Spark C and U Trace. But they are really terrific. And, and as usual, we have this longstanding tradition of helping during a time of crisis, and our students have definitely risen to the occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, and that was very Sorry, nice. nice. Um, lead into the research component up of the presentation. Um, and as I said, um, you know, the students obviously very vibrant part of our community have been helping out a lot. And this is uh, one example of the things Aaron's going to talk about where, you know, we really pulled in as a community to help. Uh, so Aaron, you want to take over? Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to share this work. It, there's no better time to be a public health expert and to be able to apply my skills and those of the teams that I work with to address this emerging and rapidly evolving pandemic. Natasha Safer Sali is also on the phone, but you can't see her, so I may ask her to offer comments. Um, so I'm, today I'm going to talk about Spark C, which is a surveillance program assessing risk and knowledge of coronavirus. Full credit for the name goes to Natasha and Alberto Caban Martinez, my partners in crime. I'm not very good with acronyms, but the intent of this project is community surveillance and to determine the prevalence of COVID-19 infection within a random representative sample of Miami-Dade County. Next slide. So as Alex already alluded to, this project involves diverse stakeholders of which the students are probably the best part. I'm actually very inspired by our students' contribution and willingness to step up. They are staffing a virtual call center, many, many long hours. They volunteered to be in the field at our testing sites to ensure that things are running with integrity. They contribute to analyses and to the developing of talking points that are shared with the mayor, who is our primary partner, as well as the media. And um, if this group of students is any indication of the future of medicine, we should all be very, very inspired. This work was actually conceptualized by Miami-Dade County and the office of the mayor with lots of insight by the man who heads up Miami-Dade Water and Sewer, Kevin Linsky, who happens to be one of the smartest mathematicians and faux public health experts that I've ever had the privilege of working with. Because Miami-Dade County is at the table, they were able to engage Florida Power and Light who's actually doing random digit dialing. So the work that we're doing as part of Spark C is unlike that reported in California and even New York to some extent, which is random surveying, which is convenience surveying. This is random surveying, where we are using random digit dialing to potentially identify a representative sample of individuals from across the county to generate the best estimate of prevalence, even given limitations of antibody testing. Next slide. So this is a little bit of, of how the project works and I'm mindful of time, so I'm gonna move very quickly. So with Miami-Dade Water and Sewer, we, developed, we divided Miami-Dade County into what we call minor statistical areas, which are census geographies for which there are corresponding sociodemographics, which allows us both to understand the population density or composition of an MSA, as well as the racial, gender, and age breakdown of the people living here. We then determined how many people from M each MSA needed to be sampled each week for the sample to be representative. Florida Power and Light uses random digit dialing to identify individuals from each of these MSAs who may potentially participate. When individuals pick up the phone, they are patched through to a virtual phone bank that is again staffed by our medical school students and they ask participants to complete a verbal consent as well as a brief telephone interview that comes from the Centers for Disease Control and assesses symptoms, known exposures, as well as comorbidities. Once that's completed, participants are signed up to come to a test location at one of 10 testing sites throughout the county. Because this is something that we're often asked, the testing sites were intentionally selected with the county manager to be along public transportation and to accommodate people within a given MSA who might only be able to get there via public transportation, bike or foot. Most of the testing locations are school, public parks, and at the testing locations, we have police presence to ensure that we're maintaining social distancing. And we've also engaged Miami-Dade Fire Rescue who is doing the actual, um, finger stick sampling. Once somebody comes to the testing site, they are then um, asked to sign the consent form and they stick their finger out the window. We do a finger stick blood sample. 
We receive, we provide them some education as well as a test interpretation sheet. And even though that the test process is within 15 minutes, we then follow up by phone within one to two hours optimally to tell them their results. Next slide. So this is both a picture of the minor statistical areas, which is our sampling frame, as well as the test site locations. Next slide. These are pictures of surveillance in action. Um, our teams have done a really good job of documenting the work that we're doing. You can see that this is drive up. You can see that our teams are appropriately wearing PPE. Um, you can't differentiate between the diverse team members who are participating in this initiative, which again includes Miami-Dade Fire Rescue, and we're incredibly lucky for their collaboration, which I think reflects ongoing work that my team does with them for cancer and work that Barry Eisenberg does with them around medical education more broadly. Next slide. Okay, so yesterday we finished our third week of surveillance. All 10 site locations were scheduled. We recruited 985 Miami-Dade residents for screening, meaning that of the people that we reached out to, 985 of them agreed to participate. And this week, like in the two weeks prior, we had an 85% 85, 85 response rate, which is extraordinarily high for this kind of community surveillance. This week, as in the last two weeks, we saw about a 6% point prevalence, and we are doing 95% confidence intervals that account for the sensitivity and specificity of the test overall, as well as 95% confidence intervals to account for the variability by different antibody. The mayor wants this testing to occur for the foreseeable future. We are working with him to figure out how to staff that long term because eventually, as Alex suggested, our students are going to go back to class and clinical rotations. And so we can't depend on them, but this may be an opportunity to close some gaps in employment for individuals who have been laid off given the downturn in the economy. We're likely to move to a once a month testing and we are starting this week ser serial surveillance as well as um, more targeted testing in communities that we have identified as being potential hotspots through community surveillance. Thank you. And then, uh, if you could go back one slide, uh, Baron, um, just if you could just uh, talk about your health disparity findings as well. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I didn't realize that we had another slide. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, you know, what I think is really interesting about what's happening in the space of COVID-19 is that it is raising a national awareness about racial ethnic disparities existing in infection burden. And for individuals like Olvin and I that have really committed our careers to understanding the etiology of this disparity and trying to do intervention research to address it, we aren't surprised. What we find in Miami-Dade County isn't any different than what's been reported nationally. We see a much higher infection among Blacks, and we're doing ongoing analysis to determine what accounts for this disparity. And whether it is a function of race as a social construct or a function of geography, and that's why it's so important that we sampled by the MSAs. We have identified hotspots, and as I suggested on my last slide, we are going to do some more targeted research to understand what these hotspots actually represent and whether there may be anything amenable to intervention. Thank you. Th uh, thank you, Erin. That was really cool uh, and really shows up, uh, again, you know, really, really critical data that's that driving uh, direct policy as we speak. Um, so really interesting. Uh, and then I'm gonna take the last um, few minutes to talk a little bit about another study that Dr. Jay and I are about to start, which is called a, a HERO program and provide a little bit of the background data uh, that led to the study. Next slide. Next slide. Um, go ahead, next slide. Um, so the study is funded by PCORI, and I think those of us that do research, um, you know, unfortunately, UM's PCORI funding background is not an extensive. Uh, PCORI uh, is sort of like a separate institute from the NIH that's supposed uh, to fund studies that uh, are called comparative effectiveness, comparing at least to alternative uh, healthcare options, focused on outcomes that are really meaningful to patients and that inform direct clinical care. Uh, the agency has given about $2.6 billion in funding already. Uh, 
not enough to UM. Uh, but for anyone who's interested in this research uh, site, uh, some of us have some familiarity with the kind of projects that they fund, and please uh, reach out to us. Um, the studies, fund the next slide. The study, uh, part of PCORI, they have this thing called PCORINET, which is a large, a humongous uh, clinical research network that's supposed to fund uh, studies that integrate data from electronic health records, claims data, and registry data that allows uh, research to be done much more faster and efficiently with lots of great, greater powers. I'll talk through in a second. Um, and it's really, again, uh, 348 of the nation's largest health systems participate in PCORINET and maybe safety net sites, which is really a unique resource. Uh, and you will see as an institution, we'll be tapping many of you to take part as these studies become more and more come down for UM to participate in this type of research. Next slide. Our, our PCORINET site is actually in partnership with the University of Florida. It's called One Florida Clinical Research Network. Um, and this network we've used already for several studies it involves 12 of the biggest academic institutions and health systems here in Florida. And right now the data set has over 15 million patients and we could use this data set uh, to both cohort discovery to conduct a lot of uh, the researchers, simple observational research, uh, but also you know, it can be done to conduct pragmatic trials, uh, which I'll talk in a second. So it's really a unique resource and everyone could come back to the slides, but there's a front door policy, how you can access the data. Again, 50 million Floridians, so it's not a data set to shy um, away from. Next slide. And these are the sites. UM obviously conducts a lot of the South Florida related research for the network, uh, but really involving a lot of major health centers, mostly in the big uh, distribution areas, but even has some rural locations as well. Next slide. So the HERO program, I'll talk a little bit about the study and the data, some of the recent data on, um, you know, that's come out um, in support of what the study is going to do. Ne next slide. So we all know healthcare workers, um, unfortunately, given the nature of our job, have been affected disproportionately uh, by the COVID epidemic. Uh, most notably, the zero conversion rate uh, is about 20% for healthcare workers, over 9,000 of them across the United States. And there's really need to be an initiative to protect the frontline healthcare workers uh, from the, uh, the transmissions uh, and becoming, um, you know, high risk individuals from COVID exposure. And until now, there's been no real proven uh, prophylactic therapy um, for prevent COVID. Um, no therapies and treatment have been proven either. Uh, but really, there's a need for some kind of prophylaxis for healthcare workers. Uh, the other thing we did see um, that's happened uh, this week, uh, the stress and burnout are really, really serious. We saw the report of one physician at a hospital I used to work with um, committed suicide, uh, one of the ER docs. But really, stress and burnout are really real concerns. And you've seen some of the emails, some of the stuff uh, UM is trying to do to mitigate that. Next slide. So there's two parts uh, to the study. One is the registry which is basically uh, designed to enroll thousands. Anyone can join the registry to collect data about our exposures to COVID and build a network from which research can be done. Next slide. Um, and from that registry, we're gonna be using the data to randomize 15,000 healthcare workers into a trial to determine if hydroxychloroquine can actually prevent that COVID-19 uh, infection. Next slide. The registry, anyone can join. You just have to be a healthcare worker uh, and there's no exclusion criteria. Next slide. The questionnaires, uh, we're gonna have uh, several questionnaires um, available. One is um, the uh, PROMIS measure that's basically one of the most used measures of general um, health. There's a daily impact of how COVID has been uh, affecting different dimensions such as stress, uh, sleep, fatigue, and anxiety. Questions about PPE. And then there's going to be some qualitative data that's going to be collected. And then there's going to be additional surveys that are going to be added to this. Next slide. And these are the types of data that people will be used. Everyone will have access to the data, but can be used uh, to use uh, things like the distribution of COVID risk factors by healthcare workers, how PPE varies across different uh, institutions, and also how COVID has affected our workers in terms of the health status. Um, and there's gonna be an opportunities for lots of ancillary studies to address additional questions. Next slide. But from that, uh, the main impetus is to be able to recruit our patients into a trial of hydroxychloroquine uh, to prevent uh, COVID-19 infections among healthcare workers. Um, I'm not sure if this slide was done previously or not, but I thought the history of hydroxychloroquine uh, was really interesting. Um, 
it came uh, from a powder in the 1600s uh, from Peru. Uh, there apparently uh, the viceroy there, his wife got malaria and used this and dramatically improved her treatment. It was finally isolated in the 1800s and then Bayer uh, finally in the 1940s synthesized uh, quinine related compounds and that were used in World War II. Um, initially, uh, the trials, it was approved as a treatment uh, initially as chloroquine, but in, then in the 1959, uh, it was able to be hydroxylated to lead to a less um, a compound that had less uh, toxicity, which is the one we're using right now, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and then in the late, even back as the late 1950s, observations were that it was of some effect also in rheumatologic diseases such as lupus, uh, and we continue to use it uh, today for that. In terms of COVID-19, uh, there's been um, treatment with hydroxychloroquine. There's a lot of in vitro data that suggests that it's an effective antiviral uh, agent. Uh, it inhibits viral re-entry and also endocytosis. Um, and there's been a lot of good basic science data that suggests it could have a meaningful role in COVID infection. Um, a recent review, there's been a couple of these systematic reviews basically concluded there's not enough evidence and we really need rigorous randomized trials to prove whether hydroxychloroquine works for COVID or not. There's one RCT, um, a couple of them were reviewed a few weeks ago here on Grand Rounds, uh, but there was a more recent one that suggests it may work, but I'll go through a second, some more recent ones that are casting doubt on this. Next slide. Of course, we don't need any randomized controlled trials to show whether it works or not. As our president said, they're effective uh, to treat COVID and his only source was not at RCT, but just his gut telling him this. Um, and as a disclaimer, he also said light and disinfectant injections may also work, which again, uh, President aside highlights the need for rigorous RCTs to show whether these drugs work. Um, in HERO, it's gonna be as a prophylaxis, but there's many ongoing studies to see whether it actually works as a treatment or not. Next slide. Unfortunately, uh, last week, uh, there was a little bit of a setback. Uh, two studies were published last week suggesting uh, questioning the use of hydroxychloroquine. Probably the most famous one was this study uh, from the VA that uh, came out last week. It was a retrospective analysis of patients hospitalized uh, with COVID across all VAs with data up, up to um, April 11th. There was 368 male patients that we evaluated. And what made the headlines was that in the group treated with hydroxychloroquine, there was a 27%, 27.8% 27 mortality rate versus 11% in the ones that didn't get it. And this was published, um, I was actually unaware of this, there's a way to get studies published without actually undergoing any peer review. It's on MedRxIV uh, where it was published, but nevertheless, it released, received a lot of media attention. Next slide. Unfortunately, it was a retrospective study and there were considerable differences among the three groups uh, in terms of baseline differences. I just looked at the study, as you will see here, the hydroxychloroquine group was much more likely to be hypoxic. 37% had O2 sats less than 95 versus those that were treated, much more likely to have respiratory distress and be smokers among risk factors. So they try to use something called propensity scores uh, to adjust for those that received the drugs. Unfortunately, the study that was published online provided very limited data about how good the propensity score matching was. Um, and so it's really hard to say what to make out of this. Um, so, uh, those of you that, you know, the media did not publish this very well, uh, but unfortunately, um, you know, the preprints up as, the, um, as they argue, the preprints were preliminary, I'm not gonna peer reviewed and should not be relied as a guide to clinical practice. So while suggesting maybe an increased mortality, obviously there were issues with that study uh, that need to be concerned. Next slide. The other study that also got a lot of press last week was this retrospective study from France, again, looking at patients, uh, this time admitted with pneumonia and required oxygen. Uh, and again, they try to use propensity scores uh, for baseline differences. Here they were not as different um, as in the VA study. And just to remind everybody, propensity scores is sort of the poor man's way of doing a randomized controlled trial. It adjusts for the propensity of actually been given the drug looking at a whole host, a large number of clinical factors, and then you develop a score, and then the probability of getting that treatment is included as part of the adjustment that's used in the analysis. Um, in this study, they actually gave some data suggesting the propensity score was decent. I was not as impressed with how good the data was on the propensity score that they used. Nevertheless, the findings of this study, unlike the VA study, was that mortality was about the same in both groups. Uh, the ones who got high, um, hydroxychloroquine versus the ones who didn't, 20% uh, uh, and 22%. 
it's a very similar finding. So one of the findings with this uh, French study was that maybe hydroxychloroquine may, may not work. Um, but again, both for uh, retrospective studies, small studies, not a lot of people, retrospective. Um, and so again, highlighting the need for rigorous uh, RCTs. Next slide. Uh, the other interesting thing that came out from the French study, and this is what really got uh, media attention, was that among the 84 patients who got the drug uh, within the first uh, 48 hours, 10% experienced uh, prolongation of the QT, which we know is um, a fact that happens sometimes with patients taking hydroxychloroquine. Uh, but usually started within the first week, and seven of them had a QT interval that was longer than, point, um, than six, six, 60 milliseconds. Um, I don't know if the cardiologist can correct me or not, but one patient had one that was greater than 500, which I did not think was compatible with life. But nevertheless, uh, several patients included uh, QT prolongation. So we're thinking about doing the uh, HERO study. I was worried whether I had to go back and learn how to do a correct QT. Um, so then I found the Bassett formula, which we all learned in medical school, how to get a correct QT, which is obviously you have to adjust for the rate. And the way you do this is you, um, the observed QT, you have to divide it by the, um, the square root of the RR interval. So um, there you go for the medical students that um, may have bored at some point. We don't know when, as for Alex. Uh, uh, there's your freebie uh, in terms of a uh, question for the study. Nevertheless, it did spark a lot of discussion about the safety of hydroxychloroquine in this study where we're going to be giving it to healthcare works. Uh, first of all, uh, there's been uh, observational studies, many, many observational studies that suggest that it's generally safe uh, and that of all the drugs being, obviously it's more safe than chloroquine. Um, and when you look at patients who take it for lupus, the American College of Rheumatology only recommends a baseline CDC, LFTs, and creatinine, and not that an EKG is recommended. And when we actually talked to a couple of the rheumatologists, they said, no, we actually don't get EKGs before we start the treatment for lupus. Um, so, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, the recommendations uh, are that we probably shouldn't get EKGs, uh, which is where we're not doing them in the HERO study, um, but it's uh, something we should all be aware of if uh, we get asked about it uh, that is currently not recommended. Obviously, the other important side effects is retinopathy, which happens with prolonged therapy, and that's why they need an ophthalmologic exam every year. And, but mostly uh, the most common side effects is nausea, which happens in about 10% of the people, primarily in a high dose. Next slide. Um, so the study on the QTC prolongation, uh, we've had, there's one large uh, randomized study ongoing right now of 6,000 patients. Uh, they're not doing AKGs, but so far uh, there's been no adverse effects uh, that have been raised of concern in that study. Uh, we do know from other studies uh, that there's really been very minimal impact on it uh, from RCTs in terms of QT pro, QTC prolongation. However, there are underlying risk factors. People with prior ca uh, um, cardiac damage from COVID, obviously myocarditis, we've heard about um, some of these reports, but most importantly is medications that prolong QTC, azithromycin and uh, fluoroquinolones uh, mostly. Um, but uh, we are excluding patients who have a history of QT, uh, congenital QT syndrome, but uh, there are medications that are prolonged QT and clearly people with electrolyte abnormalities at also higher risks uh, for this. Next slide. So the AIM study are to evaluate um, whether um, it does prevent that clinical reinfection in healthcare workers. And then there's several uh, secondary outcomes, including viral shedding and the safety and tolerability of the drug. Next slide. Um, to be in the study, it's healthcare workers at risk, so frontline healthcare workers, ICU, ER, uh, in the COVID units, respiratory services. We've already talked to a lot of the front uh, managers in these units and have a plan how we're going to approach this. Uh, but the study is only for people that have not had COVID infection yet. So if you had COVID infection or any suggestions of having a COVID infection, uh, you will be excluded from the study. At baseline, you will get serology um, as well as a nasopharyngeal swab to do the PCRs on patients. Uh, next slide. The dose is a little bit higher than we routinely use. There's been a lot of discussion about the dose and how it was shown up and how it was selected. Um, but basically, we have very limited data to drive this was uh, the thought about why the dose was initially selected. Uh, and it was after consultation with a national panel, it was a dose that was ultimately recommended to be used. Next slide. So the design is gonna be 15,000 healthcare workers nationally. Um, 
375 are going to be here from the University of Miami, and it'll be a one-to-one -one randomization. And the objective, uh, the primary objective is to see clinical infection. Again, we're conducting baseline, and then at one month, nasopharyngeal swabs and serology as well. And then there's several other uh, secondary and exploratory objectives uh, that are going to be done. Next slide. Uh, this is where you sign up for the registry. Um, as of 30 minutes ago, we got IRB approval, and thank God I could disseminate this now um, to be, um, so anyone can go up, sign up, Heroes Registry, then it refers you to a google.com document uh, where you enter your baseline information. Uh, that's going to be critically important. Next slide. And this is uh, the flyer that will be posted if you work at one of the units uh, where it's going to be advertised. And we'll also disseminate this through the Department of Medicine. And hopefully, UM will allow us to use the clinical listserv as well to disseminate information about the study. Um, let me, I'll answer a couple of uh, chat questions, if that's okay, Dr. Weiss, and then I will open it up. Yeah, there are several chat questions for you. That would be great. First, let me thank, though, everybody who spoke uh, this afternoon. This was a great combination and a tour de force of the uh, Division of General Internal Medicine and Oncology uh, and our Vice uh, Provost for Research. And everyone that was involved was uh, really very informative. And uh, thank you for putting together this extraordinary uh, effort, uh, not just the presentation, but actually everything that you're doing. We have time for a few questions, and um, you can read the questions on the chat. Um, and so, Olvin, if you'd like to just begin by answering them, that would be great. Thank you. So I think there's a lot of questions about the antibody test up, and both Erin and I have engaged in considerable dialogue up. Some of my staff have been helping her in this, but you know, up also clinically with her clinicians about these antibody tests up. And I'll start and then Aaron can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, the IgMs do cross-react and there's been some concern about how valid the IgMs are. Uh, I know some of the commercial labs like Quest are only doing IgGs because of that concern uh, about it, but there's some cross-reactivity. Um, paper was just published last week looking at the validity of many of them. And again, I think the consensus was the IgGs are pretty good for prior infection. Uh, as you know, the IgG start turning positive only maybe a week or one to two weeks after infection. No one knows how long they stay positive. But the IgMs that obviously start getting positive much earlier do have more cross-reactivity. The last I saw with these finger stick tests was that if it's a very weak IgM, that may be a cross-reaction. Uh, Aaron, um, and I know Aaron reviewed the slides up from China as well, the papers up on IgMs. Aaron, you want to add anything to that? So, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of controversy around the serologic antibody tests. I don't think they're necessarily indicated for clinical use. I think in community surveillance, we are able to statistically account for the limitations. I think somebody was asking about sensitivity and specificity, and our colleagues at UCSF just went through and actually looked at the sensitivity and specificity for many tests, including the biomedulmics tests, which we are using. And... Um, they actually broke it out by different antibody, and so we construct our 95% confidence intervals around that. MGH's validation of the test we're using had a sensitivity of 89% overall and a specificity of 100. The validation that came from the China CD, Chinese CDC, the sensitivity was 89%, and the specificity was 91%. So there's a lot of variability. I agree with Olveen, it's probably better for IgG. Um, and we are also using some methods to ensure that there's inter-rater reliability on the reading and really thinking about the strength of the band as we make decisions about how to count somebody for our epidemiologic work. Dr. Laban has a question. Josh, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, my question was, there any data on G6PD um, deficiency um, related to hydrochloroquine exposure, especially in African Americans and Mediterranean persons who have a higher prevalence? Um, I didn't see that, and I see a related um, question about high altitude. Um, I don't think uh, Jay can chime in. I don't think I saw G6PD as an exclusion criteria, but I'll certainly look it up and follow up with you. Uh, but I don't know um, if anyone else is. I think. Chime uh, in Alvin, at the, the, when the 
Duke presented this stuff, they said that it's not even in the label to do G6PD testing. So it's not a, it's not even a recommendation by the American Rheumatology Society. Somebody asked about high altitude or something else I've not heard. Well, I want to thank everyone again. This was an excellent Grand Rounds and uh, appreciate uh, the huge participation of everybody uh, on the call and, uh, and the presenters. Please, everyone, be safe and thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you.